Hi, this is Elliot Fishman. Welcome to part three on the uh, on small bowel obstruction. And we were speaking last time about how the second most common cause probably of bowel obstruction is tumors. In adults, obviously, uh, obstruction, adhesions, we think about as the number one cause. And we spoke about adenocarcinoma, and we mentioned things like carcinoid. And lymphoma is one of the other tumors. Uh, lymphoma obviously can involve any part of the GI tract. And small bowel is one of the sites that's not uncommonly involved. Usually it's a mole tumor. And T-cell lymphomas are particularly prone to bowel wall involvement and typically involve ileum or jejunum. Uh, T-cell lymphomas are very aggressive and have higher rates of bowel perforation. One thing to mention in terms of bowel uh, lymphoma, why it's important to recognize is often patients who do get treatment when they have bulky tumors, uh, tumors can, uh, you know, be very aggressive in terms of response, and those are the ones that often do perforate. As we said, small bowel lymphoma is usually a B-cell origin, more common distally, so one way of distinguishing adeno versus lymphoma. Lymphoma is more common distally, adeno more common proximally. Both can be bulky. Lymphoma tends to have more nodes than adenocarcinoma. Lymphoma tends to involve multiple organs, liver, spleen, kidneys, and we talk about adenocarcinoma, we typically think about liver. In terms of presentation, like other tumors, it's variable. It can be infiltrative, you can see aneurysmal dilatation, nodular filling defects, and an endoexenteric form with fistula. So the most common one I think we do see probably is an infiltrative uh, process, which can be very focal or more diffuse. Article by Thomas, the GI tract is the most common extraneural site of involvement in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, with disease seen at some site in up to 20% uh, of cases. I think one of the problems with lymphoma is very easy to miss bowel involvement. Here's a case, there's a few small periodic nodes, and you look on the left side, you see the small bowel is dilated, and then there's a loop that's thickened. In fact, in cross-section, it has kind of a halo which makes you think about the possibility of Crohn's disease. I'd be thinking of Crohn's. There's only small mesenteric nodes and haziness, which could also be compatible with the diagnosis of Crohn's disease. When you look at the coronal view, you really see the thickening of the bowel, both before and after, but, but, but it's not like the thickening with Crohn's. Here we're seeing diffuse infiltration. And this was a very long segment of involvement by lymphoma. I will have to admit, obviously, the pathology is there, the question lymphoma versus Crohn's. And I will admit, this is the case where it could be difficult. Crohn's is more narrowing, perhaps. Here, it's kind of edematous, and just the whole bowel is edematous. Uh, this also is a nice case to show you the value of positive contrast material. Positive can be very helpful. Well, we have seen this with neutral contrast. I think the answer is yes. You would have seen changes in enhancement, but very, very nicely shown here. Now, in patients with, uh, with B-cell lymphoma, often the presentation would be somewhat non-bowel in nature. What I mean by that is this patient had chest pain. It was a triple rule out, and you didn't see coronary disease or dissection of pulmonary embolism, but there's a large tumor involving the patient's left atrium, diffuse infiltration could be a sarcoma, could be lymphoma. When you look at the abdomen, look at that large ulcerating mass in the patient's right lower quadrant. That's classic for a large tumor. Looking at the chest, looking at this, lymphoma is the most likely diagnosis, and that was a B-cell lymphoma. Here it is again very nicely shown in the coronal view. Excellent example of the ulceration, this exophytic type of lymphoma. Very nice example. Now, I mentioned also with lymphoma, you can have polypoid masses, and when you have polypoid masses, intersusceptions are one of the problems. When you have multiple intersusceptions, you've got to really be thinking lymphoma. It could be metastasis. Primary adenocarcinoma, if you get an intersusception, is usually solitary. Multiple intersusceptions, I think lymphoma, I think melanoma. Intersusceptions are somewhat interesting. Uh, in adults, about 70% are due to tumors. Um, often it's benign tumors, including things like lipomas. Uh, when you're thinking about small bowel, in large bowel intersusceptions, there's usually malignant tumors, but not always going to be the case. In terms of intersusceptions in general, we like to think about things as benign and malignant causes. Benign causes could be congenital, meckles, cystic fibrosis. You can have inflammatory etiologies, perhaps. Tumors, you think of Poots-Jaeger's, inflammatory polyps, and lipoma. 
for malignant causes, then we're thinking about adeno and lymphoma and metastasis. And another category might be functional causes. There's an increased incidence of particularly intermittent intussusceptions in patients with celiac disease or patients with Crohn's disease. Now, when you speak about obstruction and we're thinking about CT, we also always need to mention capsule endoscopy. Capsule endoscopy was a very hot area. It's still important, but its results were not the 100% that was initially uh, described to it. Capsule endoscopy, you swallow a capsule, requires a lot of images, makes CT seem small. Here it is, 50,000, not 5,000. And you can look at the entire small bowel. Um, the original articles were impressive. Of uh, in 426 exams, only 6.3% of 27 small bowel tumors identified on capsule endoscopy were seen on prior radiology studies. Now, of course, the studies were of variable quality, but nevertheless, capsule endoscopy was shown to be very good. Now, it was especially useful in patients with occult GI bleeding, but it can miss lesions due to poor prep, rapid transit time, or the presence of blood. And I, I was on a panel, and that one of the key people from UCSF and Stanford made the point that it's only accurate about 60% of the time. So it's not a panacea. CT is the thing to do first. Even they would say, and then you can't figure out a cause, then go to capsule. And a problem, of course, is capsule retention or obstruction. We saw this patient with bowel obstruction, and we followed it down to a very large mass. This was a large tumor. This, this patient previously had had a Merkel cell tumor. Now we have metastatic Merkel cell tumor causing bowel obstruction. Well, for whatever reason, it was decided to give the patient a capsule. And guess what? There's the capsule. It ain't going very far. There's a huge mass obstructing. That's the danger with the capsule. When you have a large tumor, it's obstructing. The capsule is only going to be removed surgically. So just a very impressive example of a large metastatic disease, Merkel cell tumor, causing capsular obstruction. And there's the capsule on the topogram. Now, let me speak a little bit about metastasis. When I was writing the talk, I looked up metastatic disease of small bowel. I wanted to see what the most recent articles were. To my surprise, the most recent article of any value was one we wrote 16 years ago. Uh, I guess we've got to write a new paper. Small bowel mass in a patient with a known malignancy is likely a MET. Most common malignancies involving the small bowel are, in fact, metastatic. You can have tumor spread many different ways, intraperitoneal, seeding, hematogenous spread, or local extension. When you ask what are the most common tumors, then we're saying melanoma at the top of the list, then lung cancer, carcinoid, ovary, and colon. If I ask you to describe the patterns of spread and what is most classic, well, intraperitoneal seeding, hematogenous metastasis, and direct extension, and ovarian cancer would be the ideal thing for intraperitoneal seeding, classic implants, liver, spleen, and on small bowel and large bowel. Hematogenous mets, you got to think breast, you got to think lung and melanoma, as well as renal. And direct extension, pancreatic or biliary tumors are the most common with direct extension. Think about pancreatic cancer and how often it involves the small bowel. That's probably the number one cause. Good example here, a patient had synovial sarcoma, widespread liver mets, ascites. We scan further down, the patient has obvious bowel obstruction. The question is why? And then you look toward the right lower quadrant, and there's a very nice example of a classic intussusception. This was an impressive case because if we looked even more carefully at the bowel, there were multiple enhancing lesions in the small bowel present. These were all metastases. There were liver mets, there's ascites, there's carcinomatosis. But in this case, one of these intussuscepted. So again, just a very, very nice example. Also showing you the value of water. We, did not, we gave the patient some water, but the patient was obstructed, which is why you can see the tumors so well. We're seeing one centimeter masses. You can imagine with positive contrast, with poor distension, you may not see much of anything. I mentioned metastases like melanoma. I always think of melanoma when I see multiple lesions and ulcerating lesions and large lesions. Here's a mass involving ascending as well as descending colon. Just classic metastatic melanoma to bowel. Tumors are often ulcerating, just a very, very nice appearance. So again, you gotta be thinking about small bowel. Sometimes patients are obstructed, that forces you to think about it, and sometimes patients present with obstruction. But other times it's patients for routine follow-up, abdominal pain. Um, you wanna look carefully at the bowel. Again, IV contrast is critical in making the right 
and diagnosis as well as detecting the lesion. So concluding then, CT, particularly with CT enterography, builds in our experience with CT of the small bowel and is ideal for looking at or is suspicious for bowel obstruction. Again, the role of imaging in terms of axials, coronals, sagittals, and 3D are important. The importance of scan protocols. CT enterography provides the opportunity for increased lesion detection and characterization. Again, as we went through some of the cases, it's not just saying there's a mass present. One could be very specific as to what that mass is. And again, scan protocols are critical to success in, in lesion detection because they're small. And it's not just scan protocols, it's interpretation protocols. How do you read the studies? Are you reading axials and routinely coronal and sagittals or just, you know, doing everything? What are you doing? And I think your success is based on that. So with that, I think I'll stop right here. That was a great three-part adventure. And hopefully we've uh, shown you a bit more about uh, bowel obstruction and how we can analyze it and how CT can be used in management of those patients. Thank you very much.